to our next installment of things that can be done in Hypermesh. Um, today we are talking about morphine. So the last couple of days we've done meshing, geometry cleanup, those type of things. Uh, we're going to talk morphine and why and how and maybe a little bit of that, of, of what it can be used for. It will make 100% sense uh, right now, but we'll go ahead and drop a model in, just drag and drop my model into the screen here. Okay, the premise of morphine is I would like to be able to change my mesh, whether this is a bulk data file that's 50 years old, or it's you know a model that you made the other day, um, or whatever it is, I'd like to be able to change my mesh, uh, the shape of it, right? So maybe um, after, you know, years and years, uh, this, you know, one of these intercostal holes has been plugged, it's been recut, it's been all sorts of things. Uh, but now the, the shape that the, the BDF file originally shows or my mesh originally shows is no longer the actual shape of what's there, right? So that's kind of the premise that we have. Um, and we can do that with morphine. The reason why we would use morphine is that when we morph, we're not changing the node and element IDs of the underlying mesh. All we're doing is moving them around, but they're not changing, which is great, especially if you have loads applied to these nodes and elements, because if you were to remesh, you would lose all of that data. Okay, so um, a few workflows that we can do within uh, the newest version of Hypermesh. Uh, there's three different types of morphine that we're going to cover, and let's just do them. Uh, the first one is going to be free morph, and to do this, I'm actually going to take advantage of some of the geometry capabilities within HyperWorks. Um, again, they don't have to do this. In fact, a, a very reasonable workflow is to actually, you know, import your old mesh and then maybe import new geometry. Uh, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of say, well, the the size of this hole is different, right? Maybe it looks like this. Then I'm going to go ahead and move this hole, uh, line it to the part. Back here, I'm going to go shift to move my move tool, get it pointed in a good direction. Move it over here. Next direction. Why? It doesn't have to be perfect. Oh. Hey, would you go all the way down there? This is where snaps can kind of get you. So, um, okay. Perfect. Uh, so that's kind of the new the new place that my hole is, right? That's the new diameter, dimension, etc. Um, I was just using this again. This could be all new geometry that you import uh, from. But now when I come to my morph tool, uh, the first morph that I'm going to do is I'm going to do a free morph. Okay, and this free morph allows me uh, to select either nodes or we can even move faces. We can move edges. Uh, this time, you kind of see I want to move this edge, the circle edge of, of nodes. And you're probably thinking, well, if he wants to move them to that line that he just skillfully made, then I, I very much do. So uh, I have the option to pick a target. So I'm going to go and select a target. Happens to be this line. And as soon as I select that, get a little option here. Uh, none of this is super important right now. And all we're going to do is hit morph. And what we're going to see is that mesh goes to the new uh, geometry, right? I have I have morphed it to this new target, and this target could be uh, a new surface. You could move a face of elements to a new face. You can move an edge of elements to new edges, especially if you're doing 2D type of stuff. This is, is very applicable. Okay. And you see a lot of the stuff that used to be within morphine is, is put in the background now. So there was this automatic selection of anchors. This is where uh, the morphine is not going to extend past. And then this idea of a morph area, because it would be very easy for us to just move individual nodes, but at some point you're gonna start to have very poor element quality. So what morphine also does is it kind of averages this movement this nodal movement around throughout this volume or this area that you, you've selected and um, such that you don't get really, really skewed elements, right? Um, there is an option to remesh within all of this. So there's uh, lots of lots of different options for morphine on the board. It's just super crazy how many options there are. None of them particularly important, by the way. Um, 
but one of them is remesh, which kind of defeats the purpose of morphing because you remesh, then you change your node and element IDs and you know, just start over from the beginning. Okay. Uh, so that's the morph. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to save this as a shape. And uh, shapes are going to seem a little weird right now, but they'll come in handy later. Uh, so I have this option to save this as a shape. I'm going to hit the plus button to say create the shape. And what I actually see on my screen is these are actually all of the nodal movements that were uh, contributing to make this shape, right? Uh, I just see little vectors on each on each um, node. And this is important. So this is shape is going to be saved. If I look over in my model browser, I see that I have a shape now. And what I would actually do is I want to go back to default. I want to undo all of my morphs, but I would like to keep the shape there. I have a shape kind of browser, a little pop-up that will allow me to uh, preview these shapes. I can turn them on and off and you can kind of see how the graphics changes. Looking at this now, I probably should have added this hole as an anchor, should have added some more nodes. Uh, but let's go ahead and do that somewhere else. Okay. So you can kind of see how we can map to geometry. Um, let's see some other things that we could probably do is let's make this little stiffener a little taller. So I'd like to just come in here, pre morph. Once again, I'd like to move this edge up. I don't have any targets this time, but that's perfectly fine. Uh, and maybe I want to keep the other edges the same. So instead of having automatic anchors, I'm going to turn that off. And then when I come to anchors, I'm going to come and add some anchors around here, just as an example, right? So I can, if the automatic isn't doing it for you, go ahead and add your own anchors. That's perfectly fine. Um, and then instead of selecting a target, I'm just going to use the manipulator in the graphics window. Okay. Uh, so back here, I'm going to reorient my manipulator. So remember, uh, holding shift on any move tool will allow you to move the move tool. So I just moved the Y axis and snapped it in line here so that I move this in Z. It moves up in Z. Okay. Again, you probably you probably have a number in mind. Uh, you know, I don't know if I've ever met an engineer that just like moved something and didn't know how much they were moving it. So <laughs> um, you can put the number in, right? If you know that this translates, that you kind of want this to be maybe 10 centimeters, inches, again, I don't know, units taller in a particular direction. You could just you know, type that into your uh, little dialog box here. Okay. Uh, it's good practice to save that as a shape. So I'm gonna go ahead and create that as a, another shape and undo all my morphs. And then uh, last thing that I like to do is I like to move, uh, free move, instead of a, an edge of elements, let's just move a face. Okay, so I want to move this face of uh, elements up. Before I do that, let's just do automatic anchors because it'll be easier on my life. So you see it anchors down here with all these nodes and the affected elements that are going to move are in, in the dark. Once again, I will move my move tool by holding shift. I will get this on oops. these shift. Get this on a piece that I like. Okay, so now I have this kind of normal direction, and then I'll just move this, the height of that stiffener up. Okay. Again, there's lots we can do with morphing. We can link these morphs together. We can do all sorts of things, but I'm just going to go ahead and once again save this as a shape and undo all my morphs. So you're probably thinking, well, Blaze, why are you saving all these shapes? Um, this is great. I understand how I can use this if the bulk data file changes, if my geometry changes, and I don't want to remesh my part. I can map it to new new things. Um, I also want to plan in your head that these can be used in an optimization, right? So maybe there is the question of we don't really know how tall this stringer or frame or stiffener needs to be, right? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to uh, take this and ask, you know, what are the advantages from a structural standpoint of making this taller, right? Obviously, there's going to be a trade-off in weight, but does that weight come with an increase in stiffness? Am I okay 
with that trade-off. Okay. Um, so making these as shapes, I'm able to ask that question. I mean, I will be able to ask that question uh, later on as in um, what are all the effects of these things, right? So I just want you to keep that in mind. Why am I making all these individual shapes? That's kind of why I want you to get into a habit of, of making these shapes, okay? So this is this is free morphing, and free morphing can be a, as you know silly as just grabbing a single node and then using the manipulator to move it somewhere, right? That's as as basic as it can get. And as you escape, you just hit escape a couple times. Um, you, know, you can save this as a shape. I'm not going to save that as a shape. Just Control Z, exit out of that. That is that is the free morphing, right? So if I like to map to a, another a new part, map to new geometry, those different types of things. Um, we've also introduced this idea of a proximity morph, which is similar to free morphing. Uh, free morphing does a little bit smarter stuff about where it tries to, you know, clamp and lock and, and affect elements or nodes. Uh, the proximity morph um, just is proximity. So it's going to say. Um, if I go and hey, say selected edge of one of these stiffeners on this part, uh, it's just going to say anything within a proximity, I am going to be allowed to alter or allowed to, to take the larger effect of this change, right? Um, so I'm going to bump this down to 40. You'll see it kind of live. It'll shrink the number of elements. This is kind of a live view of what this looks like. <clears throat> I can map this to targets as well, but this is just kind of a little more local. Right, so the proximity is a little more, just think of this as a little more type of a local uh, machine, uh, not machine, morphing operation. Uh, so I'm just gonna move my system there. And so if I, if you know, again, I'm wondering how does the effect of this height of this stiffener, what does that do to my model? So you know, I can kind of bump this out, but you kind of see how that effect gets propagated to all of the elements that were within in that that region, right? So if I want to say, what if I move it to the left a smidge? If I move it to the right a smidge, um, I'd like to move that. This to the left a smidge. Different view left. I see how the elements on either side of this shrink or grow according, but it's only within that proximity. Okay. Um, so again, I can save this as a shape. And this is just an idea vector perturbation of the nodes. Uh, so free and proximity are pretty close. Um, I think proximity is quite cool. This is a new one. Uh, this is probably, you know, you don't want to affect too much of your model. Uh, this is a real quick way to, to pick out those zones. And then the last one is volume. Honestly, I have zero idea of how you would use this in aerospace, but I'll show it to you anyway, because that's the kind of person I am. Um, so what, uh, what volume allows us to do is it allows us to enclose a group of elements, nodes, pick your poison. And uh, instead of being, I guess you can say that these are a little more engineering, right? These are, I can move, I can translate something a certain distance. I can snap it to another location. Uh, the idea of volumes, um, kind of takes this to the next level of saying, well, really anything within this volume is going to be affected by these morphs. And it's not necessarily a hard stop between these volumes because they're going to be connected. Um, so what is I did, I, I enclosed all the nodes and then I just split this three times in each direction according to this enclosure. And what I can do now is I can move these and I can move like a face and what we're going to see is this underlying group of elements is going to take the brunt of this. However, that change is going to be propagated to the surrounding volumes as well. So if I kind of move this normally, right, you're going to get something that looks like this. I don't know what this looks like, uh, but essentially, you know, we're kind of enclosing, grouping elements together and averaging the change uh, that you were asking for across that. So Again, what is the actual application of this in aerospace specifically? I don't really know. Like maybe, maybe it's, I don't know. I can tell you I, what I've seen as an automotive example where they take like a four-door sedan 
and turn it into kind of a hatchback, right? So they they take that back portion of the sedan and kind of you know bump it up a little bit. Uh, again, there's no remeshing. All your loads and boundary conditions stay the same. Node and element IDs stay the same. Um, this is just a different way. Maybe this could be something for conceptual design where you're trying to turn a eight passenger jet into a 12 passenger jet. You can kind of stretch it a little bit. Um, again, I, I'd have to, you'd have to, you'd have to sell me on how to use this, but I'll show it to you because it's, I don't know, it's fun. But maybe we just need a little more fun in engineering. So that's morphine in kind of a nutshell. There are tons of other options. We can get very deep into morphine. There's constraints. You can link variables. So when this morph moves, the other morph moves. Uh, there's all different types of things that, that can be done. But I really want to plant in your head that uh, the main purpose for this is legacy bulk data files can be updated to new geometry pretty easily, especially if the change is not ginormous, right? Um, probably hard to change like a 747 into a 737. But, you know, the difference between a 737 max and a 737 max 10, you know, could probably be accounted for with some slight variations in the original mesh. Um, then same thing with legacy programs, right? So if you have a part or a, a airframe that's gone through, you know, MRO process and parts have been taken on and off and there's holes here, they got closed up there, they got moved, hoggled out, they're bigger, smaller, um, all those types of things can be done. And also it can be used for optimization, which, which is something that I near and dear to my heart that we will explore, which is why I had you save all those shapes um, that we can ask these what if questions. What if the hole was bigger? What if it was smaller? What if the web was bigger? What if it was smaller? Um, you know, uh, it's not just gauge optimization. You'll just have to deal with thicknesses. You can do you know, shapes and see how the shape of things uh, can change. But, Okay, with that, that's kind of my, my last little preachy bit. Um, last thing I did want to show is within here, all of these shapes, uh, can you can make a little animation of them as well. So if I'd like to see, so remember shape one, I believe was this, oh, this little hole right back here. Um, I can hit play and it will do a little animation and that's cute and you can save the animation. You can go through all of these different shapes if you'd like, so. And you can even contour it to show you the shape change. It, wow, all sorts of different fun stuff if you'd like to do. So I can load, load in videos for all of these, what all of these shapes are now. This one's over there. So um, with that, I, uh, I will kind of end today. I believe next time is 1D meshing. Got lots of nice, great stuff for, for 1D meshing now. Um, and with that, we all into it.